That's a you know, good response, I think. <laughs> so, my name is Imran Khan. I was educated by the block at Kanda University. I was there for a journalism degree. And when I was there, my professors were all going, this guy is great. He's my favorite student. He's way ahead of the curve. And I took that skill and knowledge, and I turned it into video games. So, if you've been spared that particular conversation with your brother, consider yourself lucky, because it's something. So, I, it's very difficult for me to, I wrote this title, and I tell them to really reconsider it instead of writing a speech, like, why diversity in video games matters. And that's, for me, it makes sense, because for me, I spend a lot of my life playing video games. I spend a lot of my income on video games, a lot of my income on writing about video games. So, to me, it makes sense, because it matters. Video really games matter. But the people who don't play them, it, I don't know that it's an easy argument to make. So I was hoping to maybe start with something a little bit more relative. When I was in elementary school, when I was just a tiny kid in a small Tennessee town of 60,000 people, there was a very difficult part of me that did not understand what race was, and more importantly, what race I was. The most important like, racial identification tool I had was the Crayola box, because I knew I wasn't white, I knew I wasn't black. So I told people I was mixed. And my parents explained to me the word Bengali. They told me that we, you know, our family didn't come here. I was born in Jackson, so I, I didn't really understand the idea of being from somewhere else. So I didn't really understand the whole thing. And it turns out when you have a kid who consumes a whole lot of media, because I was raised by video games. I like my parents did a good job, but I was raised by video games and TV and my racial identification heroes, I guess, were Apu and Ahasapena Penelon and Dalsi from Street Fighter. So it turns out that when our generation, or my generation, the first one to grow up with video games with identifiable avatars and protagonists, it turns out if you have enough of those in volume, that can kind of mess you up racially, because you kind of don't really understand. So I thought, you know, this doesn't really matter to me. Like, does it really matter what race I am? Is that kind of a social construct? It's, I'm not really anything. And I thought this is a progressive idea. I thought that this is what really the future is like, that no one's going to really care about race. And the thing that showed me out of this was this character that I don't know that anyone is going to recognize immediately. Jason Brody from Far Cry 3. Now, if you've never played Far Cry 3, you're kind of lucky, because Jason Brody sucks. <laughs> Jason's story is that he and his friends got kidnapped and were held hostage on an island. And the story of Far Cry 3 is that Jason kill off the island culture. He, he is the great white hope for this noble, savage nation. And I had a very significant problem, because before, I was thinking, it doesn't really matter what protagonists' race are, what the protagonist is like. But then I started playing Far Cry 3, and I was like, wow, this really super matters, because I cannot get past this character. I cannot understand how I'm supposed to be him. And it's actually harboring har 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 my enjoyment of the game. So I took this revelation of, holy crap, race matters, to the internet, expecting choruses of agreement, and I did not find it. <laughs> I found people saying, there's nothing weird about this. There's nothing inappropriate or ill-fitting or anything wrong about slotting yourself in Jason Brody. And I could not figure out what they thought this character was supposed to be, except that I eventually realized he makes sense for the target audience. He doesn't make sense for me, because I have no white power fantasy of going to an island and like becoming their ideal. But a significant portion of the target audience does. And this quickly became a problem for me. And this came to my eventual realization that video games where I can identify with a character are more engaging than video games where I cannot. And this might seem like it should be obvious, but if it's not obvious to you, don't worry, because it took me 27 years. And people, I have, I've had people tell me that 
it doesn't matter. If the game is good, if it's fun, if it's, uh, if it's, uh, I hate to use a word that has a bad association these days, but objectively fun, is, then it shouldn't matter who the protagonist is or what they look like. And that's a decent argument, actually. It's really hard to argue against that. But the problem is that argument comes from positions that are already entrenched. Like, even if you're white and you don't like Jason Brody, you have thousands of examples of other people you can relate to. You can, you have every wavelength and degree that you need to to find something you can identify with. For me, it was, no, again, Dawson. And it's actually kind of ironic because Far Cry 4 turned out to be something that I ended up going to a lot because they had a Nepalese character named Ajay Gale. And like, that's one of the reasons that I realized like, it wasn't just that Jason Bono was really bad, it's that there was no other examples for me. So it turns out, like, I was talking to Asian people, women, like, gay people, it's, they don't have the representation that they need, that they, and they may have not had their Jason Brody moment yet, where they're realizing that something is wrong. They just think, well, this is just the industry. And I reject that thinking. I think that's a broken thing. So let's go with a little statistics real quick, because I think it might make sense to get a measure of the problem here. In 2003, 50% of player control characters are white, and 40% are black. And that might seem like a, you know, a fairly okay number, considering you know, what the AAA industry actually looks like. And uh, I'm gonna use this term about AAA, but AAA basically means higher budget and stuff, like above 20 million, 25 million. But the number of 50% includes, or does not include characters that have no identifiable race, so like, for example, Banks from Legend of Zelda. He's an elf, so he has a kind of white, which I think is strange. <laughs> <laughs> and the 40% black characters are, you guessed it, from sports games, which I was talking to uh, Dr. Kishana Gray from the Eastern Kentucky, RDC Kentucky University Justice Department, and she said, and this is my favorite thing Professor has ever said to me ever, Fuck out of here, that doesn't count. <laughs> and she's right, it doesn't count. Like, why would you, that doesn't, Kobe Bryant doesn't count as a black character. He's an actual person. You don't count as a black character. In 2005, 72% of characters playable or otherwise are white. 2008, 74% of all leading characters are white, with 4% being black, again, all in basketball games. So if you're not white and you're having problems with representation, the numbers aren't good for you, and they're not getting any better. So we're going to do a little bit of minutia here about how video games are made, so bear with me for a second. Video games are getting more expensive to make, and the reason they're getting more expensive to make is the visual fidelity keeps increasing, and how the standards for how much people are willing to play are. So you're, for $60, they need to keep getting better and better looking. And that costs more and more money. It's kind of a movie problem, except that we think it's keep rising and then we're another system. So, because it's getting more expensive to make, the video game publishers are honing in on target audiences that they already think are more receptive to always coming out. And this target audience they keep thinking comes out are white males age 15 to 30. Basically, the Jason Brody's of the world. And I. Again, I disagree with that because I'm not a white male age 15 to 30. Well, 15 to 30 yet yeah, applies, but quite on that. So while the audience itself is expanding, the diversity within the video game industry is shrinking because everything needs to pay. Everything needs to sell five million copies. And they think that you and I are going to end up just buying whatever. Because we have no choice in the matter. If we want a game, it has to be the Jason Brody game. But they not, they're missing the financial argument that, okay, so I buy everything, so I'm a bad man. But you might not buy anything. You might buy more if stuff's so dear. And the financial issue there is that they're missing the expanded audience. So I made up this little example here that I'm hoping is not too stupid. So let's imagine there's a party. And the party is set for, let's say, 5 o'clock. And the host is bringing people in because he wants to mingle with them. And so the very first people at this party are Mario and Link. And Mario and Link are not bad guys. They're, they care about their brother, they involve, like, they enjoy life, and they enjoy being with other people, but they just happen to get to this party faster than anyone else. 
So they're there, and the host is giving them 100% of the attention. They're giving them 100% of the drinks and the food and the general party atmosphere surrounding them. But that's just for right now. Oh, this is not moving the way I thought it was. Oh, there we go. That's way more than this. Okay. So Doc Lewis from Punch Up comes in. Now the party's starting to feel a little bit better. Like, more people are starting to come in, everyone's having fun. More people, uh, Princess Zelda comes in, the Sandman, Dr. Kawashima. This is a diverse and interesting party. And the, like, the general area is becoming more colorful from different backgrounds, different life contexts. But the problem is that the party host is still focusing on Mario and Link. They are still giving them all the attention. If the goal was to mingle with everyone, why are they only focusing on these two people that were here first? Why would they be the only ones to get drinks or food? And if you're at this party as well, wouldn't you even think it was kind of weird that the two people who were there first are the only ones to get any attention? This is the main reason, I think, that we should actually diversify in games. Like, there's the financial argument, there's the argument about gameplay mattering, but really, it just, we should. I've been fortunate in my life that even though I faced racial discrimination, I had somebody who attacked me in high school with a pipe after 9-11 for reasons I'm not entirely sure I understand still. <laughs> but it's not been as inhibitory to me as it could be. This, it doesn't mean that it's still okay. It doesn't mean that social progress should stop. Social progress should always keep going. If the worst case scenario happens that it just slows down as much as possible, it will drag itself through the dirt to keep going. The main issue, I think, in life is that we're all feigning confusion about why things aren't moving forward. And it's not like there's no roadmap. We have a roadmap. We're just all choosing not to go through it because we're all scared of the possibility of getting it wrong. And we're going to get it wrong occasionally, but we have to try. Is there anyone out there whose life would be better without diversity? Is there anyone who thinks the role of social change in money doesn't understand how diversity better helps every industry? I'm going to guess no. I'm going to guess there's going to be people who pretend not to, but no one whose life would be better. So what do we do? I don't know if you've realized this in recent months, but gamers are very reluctant to change. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe don't take the argument to them. If you think, I know it's tempting to go on Twitter and be like, what the hell is up with Jason Brody? I've done it before, I've done it for years. It, it never worked that well. <laughs> but if you, wow, that skipped way forward. You want to take this directly to developers and studios. Support independent developers that are doing what you want. So, uh, Fulbright Studios Gone Home is one really good example. There's good examples of video games that take on depression, of transphobia, of other issues that you want to really communicate to them that you matter. We are in the weird age of the internet that's transformative, that we are no longer an anonymous blob. We are a collective of individual people with names and identities, and use that. Use that to talk to students. Use that to tell them why you matter. Uh, I was going to take longer to talk about our very different question, but really quickly, I just want to go up. There's a Pace Magazine article that I just put up a couple of weeks ago. Cover versus an issue, but more about race. Uh, has some comments from Dr. Adrian Chan and Dr. Kishana Gray, who I mentioned before, about why this happens. So if we want to really get a 30 second question in, anyone who has a burning question? Back there. Um, I think this is a very interesting topic that you um, touched on because we're seeing that happen, especially with movies, like how the Marvel Universe is opening up, but right. it's also opening up with diversity. And my, what I would like to understand from you is what do you think would force the, or excuse me, speed up that change in video games? What would speed up that change in video games is if the audience made themselves known. If there were people who didn't, let's just say one year nobody who was black about Call of Duty. You know how much sales would sink? At least seven million. And that would kill Activision and like inside, like we have to figure out why this is. And that's the only thing to do is support who you uh, who you can and then let them know why. 
All right, thank you so much for letting me speak here today. I know this is a strange topic, but I really appreciate it. Thank you.